Welcome to Open Mind Integration. This is Christopher Gunlock, and we're at part six of the Psychedelic Harm Reduction class, DIY Do-It-Yourself Harm Reduction. And check out all 12 parts of this class at openmindintegration.com. Mind the disclaimer. This class is for the folks that like using psychedelics their own way. It's for folks who they find the freedom of exploring their 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 mind, their their conscious experience is something that they want to be in control of and, and to navigate without uh, a, a greater authority kind of determining you know what that looks like. So I, I hope to uh, to provide um, a number of critical uh, issues that um, you have to navigate given the intense skepticism and, and stigma and uh, legality issues. So we'll go into depth on all those things. So you'll be able to um, traverse this space safely and, and responsibly. So when I say DIY, do it yourself, uh, you know, I, I, I'm not just thinking about it as a, a, a excuse to have some fun, to get away with, you know, being dangerous or, or rebellious. Um, it's, it's got a deeper implication, something that I, I think is important for all of us really. And which is why I made a whole class about this and, um, you know, that, that gets down into just, just the nature of our consciousness and how intimate of a, a thing that is for each and every one of us, how unique that experience is. And this idea of cognitive liberty is, uh, just, just saying that because it is our most intimate thing, it ought to be our own. And, and um, you know, the, when, when you think about something like that being taken away from you or being controlled uh, by an outside force, um, it's really disempowering. And so I see psychedelics as a, a really a big statement for self-empowerment. Uh, and that's that's why yeah I made a whole class about this. It's uh, it's not just an excuse to party, right? This is um, this is your ability to traverse the infinite vast uh, scapes of your consciousness, and um, and to be able to do that freely is a big deal. All right, so drug harm reduction 101: supply safety. This is super critical. Uh, anytime you're you're dealing with um, substances that are unregulated, uh, you're gonna have to do your homework to figure out what what uh, it is you're taking and and uh, how safe it is. So um, definitely some important stuff to start off with. So just because it's maybe easy to remember, uh, I'm I'm gonna come right out the gate with the most dangerous drug combos. This is designed to be a short list of, of just the, the ones you're, you're most likely to come across and are also the most risky. And uh, some of these can definitely kill you, so uh, please, please, please be aware. Um, MAOIs, the monoamine oxidase inhibitors, uh, mainly you're just going to come across this in ayahuasca, but uh, be, because ayahuasca is uh, such an important and, and prominent psychedelic, um, you, you got to be careful with this one. It's it's no joke. Uh, there's there's a lot of lot of drugs, a lot of pharmaceuticals, but um, uh, drugs in general that uh, can be very very dramatically different with uh, the combination of, of the MAOI. So uh, you can also find MAOIs and a few other things. There's some there's some kind of herbal MAOIs, the Harmies, and um, the the DMT combinations like Changa that. Um, yeah, I mean, the TMT alone is going to be intense, but um, stuff like that also has an MAOI. So be aware when that's in your system and if you're taking something else. Mainly, we're talking serotonergic drugs like SSRIs, but um, a lot of things uh, interact with the MAOIs. Um, the, it's, it, the MAOs in our body are, are there for a reason. They, they are, are meant to break down a lot of like neurotransmitters and other substances that could otherwise have a heavy effect on our state of consciousness. So um, that's why that's one of the reasons why ayahuasca is so intense too. But um, yeah, yeah, just be careful with this one. Look up the list. They're long lists in terms of contraindications, but uh, it's it's important to to be aware. Uh, 
Uh, 5-MeO DMT and Bufo, um, just throwing this one on the list in general. Uh, there's a few, a few combinations in particular to look out for. Uh, MAOIs, obviously. Uh, SSRIs, but uh, also stimulants. I mean, basically anything that's going to get the heart pumping. Um, be careful with this one. It's a bit more cardiotoxic than other tryptamines, uh, particularly the toad venom. Um, the, the natural stuff has, has a lot of bufotenin in it and, and basically hard to know how harsh it's going to be. Um, the synthetic's a bit safer. Uh, Ibogaine. Ibogaine is a, a powerful psychedelic. Uh, some say one of the most powerful, if not the most powerful. And of course, uh, with anything sufficiently powerful, it can it can definitely damage you. This one uh, is is known to kill people for sure. Sometimes just from negligence, but um, it's tough. You know, it's it's it puts a serious strain on the heart. Uh, a lot of cardiotoxicity, um, but particularly nasty when mixed with uh, some some key substances. Unfortunately, some of the ones that people are trying to get off of when they go and take ibogaine. Uh, fentanyl, methadone, and suboxone, it's tough. Like, like those ones are kind of the big baddies, and especially in the opiate world. Um, but Ibogaine can help. You just have to be sure to be off of those particular ones uh, before you take the Ibogaine. Uh, same with some other psychiatric meds. Uh, definitely consult with a physician or a very experienced practitioner on this one. Uh, Ibogaine is no joke. MDMA. MDMA, while you know it's it's fairly safe in in terms of its use, mostly um, one one bad mixture, and you could be in real hot water with this one. Uh, alcohol, stimulants, opiates, serotonergics. You know you don't really want to be on um, a whole lot of weird psychiatric meds. Um, SSRIs are safe to take with MDMA, but uh, there there is an interaction. You just may not notice it until after the MDMA wears off and um, that come down could be pretty rough. So um, mixing really anything with MDMA is is not the best idea. Um, so please be careful with that one. On top of that, MDMA is a bit intense on the body, uh, the uh, heart rate, body temp, dehydration. Um, there, there can be a lot going on there, especially depending on what you're doing. So careful with that. Alcohol plus ketamine. Just don't do it. It's uh, really intensely strong. Ketamine can knock you out completely. Alcohol can starve the, the brain of oxygen. Um, yeah, yeah, that's a real quick way to die. So please don't do that. All right, uh, on to the next area of risk here. Um, impurities, adulterants, adulterants, and deceptions. So impurities, we're talking uh, bad manufacturing um, for the most part, uh, especially black market stuff, uh, typically not made in the most ideal conditions, uh, sometimes really far from ideal. So, you know, especially if you're working with some powders and pills, it's hard to know exactly what you're taking. Um, impurities can be invisible, truly, and, and even just a little bit of some of them. Uh, it can be not good. So, so uh, try to get the cleanest stuff you can. Um, <laughs> There's kind of an art to that. The black market is a, is a tricky realm to navigate. Um, but the more you know, the better. Uh, the more people you know that can speak well of it, the better. But um, it's, yeah, yeah, it's hard to know who to trust uh, sometimes. But um, adulterants, so this is when there are other psychoactive chemicals, maybe similar, maybe different, maybe a lot different, mixed in with the thing that you think that you're getting. And so obviously that's going to change the effects uh, potentially in a dangerous way. Uh, again, hard to know. You know, it can be invisible. A lot of these are just pills and powders, white powders. You know, you can just mix them together and get something that looks very similar. And um, so, so please be careful. Um, deceptions. It's more kind of a general uh, pointing at uh, the when you're getting something maybe potentially totally different from what you thought it was. You know, again, pills and powders and tabs. Uh, you don't really know until you put it in your mouth, to be honest. So. Uh, you're rolling the dice there. Uh, is it is it LSD or is it something else or you know is it Molly or maybe it's something else? Uh, could be fentanyl, you know. So uh, careful out there. Um, and and in general, my little chart on the right there, uh, the in the order of risk, 
uh, the powders and pills at the top. Yeah, yeah, uh, for sure. Again, it's so easy to mix things. It, it, everything kind of looks the same. And then at the bottom there, you've got your organics, you know, plants and mushrooms, obviously a little harder to adulterate and, and uh, you know, less often has the impurities in it because um, uh, it's a plant. So, yeah. Also, some very important metrics to uh, measure your substances by potency, quality, and reliability. So potency, yeah, generally we want something more potent because that yeah, generally equals less impurities, uh, less waste. Um, quality, though, too, uh, if you can know something about who made it, uh, that's ideal. Uh, and how they made it, uh, you know, are they, you know, reputable, um, all those things, if you can ascertain, uh, try to do so. Otherwise, it's, it's, it's just one big question mark there. So uh, reliability, though, too. So that's, that's kind of pointing to the, the longevity of it, um, you know, storage and um, the actual quality of it can, can alter a lot, you know, what you're actually working with, the, the potency and the quality of it. So again, and um, the risks of these increases uh, with you know, in that order of the type of substance you have. So drug testing kits can be a nice thing to have. Uh, they're very cheap and, and you can find them in a lot of different places, uh, a lot of harm reduction services. Uh, shout out to Southside Harm Reduction in Minneapolis. Uh, they'll, they'll just give them away, you know. So um, understand what they're doing, though. They are testing substances one at a time. And, and so they can tell you whether or not one particular substance is in the drug that you're testing, uh, but it's not, you're not going to know if anything else is in there and you're not going to know how much of the thing you're testing is in there. So usually folks are looking for, you know, fentanyl, you know, see, so make sure their powder doesn't have any of that. Um, so there's some limitations. So just understand that, but it can be nice to have nonetheless. So I do think this is an important topic to touch on because, uh, you know, obviously psychedelics, they, they come with a little bit of baggage, unfortunately, you know, not for great reasons. Um, but uh, nonetheless, we this is the reality that we live in. So it, it's good to just take note of there are maybe some boundaries around what you might want to say about psychedelics. Um, obviously, I talk a lot about psychedelics and everything I say is perfectly within the realm of legality. Um, because basically I, I just make sure I don't cross the line of sharing sources, being involved with the trafficking of the substances. That's, that's the big one right there. Um, anytime you, you link yourself to the act of, of either trafficking or using the substances, um, that's when you, there's, there's a potential to, to be connected to a crime. And, um, you know, I'm not trying to give you legal advice here. I'm just pointing out the facts that, um, if somebody really wanted to, um, you know, connect you to an act, um, sharing the details of the, the who and the when and the where, uh, those kinds of things, um, that, that can implicate you. So, um, just make sure you draw that line, uh, especially if you're speaking, speaking in public or something like that. We'll talk about that on the next slide, but, um, otherwise talking about psychedelics, you know, everything in this harm reduction class, you, you know, it's, it's, this is, this is about information and education. And, and again, fortunately we live in, um, a, a country with fairly well speech protected laws. And, um, so, so, you know, beyond the risks of your reputation, um, you know, speaking about psychedelics can be a good thing. So to make it really simple, there are certain people that are particularly risky to speak about psychedelics. And, and, and again, in particular, anything involving the trafficking or manufacturing of psychedelics, that's, those are the hot button topics right there. Um, again, otherwise it's more so just your reputation that you, you may be risking. So obviously police, um, I, I, I like to remind folks that, you know, while police are human beings too, um, they are trained to potentially lie to you and to manipulate you into, um, yeah, uh, criminalizing yourself. So, uh, saying the wrong things is one of the easiest ways to do that. So, um, again, draw a boundary there. Maybe just don't talk to police about psychedelics at all. Uh, it's usually just a safe way to go. Um, therapists, doctors, uh, any, any kind of licensed medical, uh, uh, practitioner, um, and, and potentially maybe people peripheral to them, 
Uh, unfortunately, it's kind of a similar situation there uh, as, as police where they are actually trained to um, take people's rights away in some cases. Uh, mandatory reporting is, is part of that. Uh, if, if they deem you to be a danger to yourself or others, uh, they, they can take your rights away. Uh, so, um, you know, hopefully you have a good relationship with your therapist where you can have a, a, a fairly wide breadth of, of freedom to say certain things about psychedelics. But, um, you know, consider that some people may be assume a lot of the wrong things about psychedelics and maybe just don't know any better and, and could view your involvement with them as, as being harmful. So, um, yeah, just, just be careful there. Uh, and then just in general, just because this is an incredibly taboo subject that most people don't have the adequate information on and may have a lot of misinformation uh, that they're basing their opinions off of, um, just people that you don't know or it's just in the, the wrong kind of setting, you know, if you're not at the right kind of party, maybe don't bring that up, <laughs> bring up something else. Um, so yeah, it's unfortunately a little tricky. You know, again, this is, you know, we have, we have to do these things, not necessarily for great reasons, but this is the reality of the world we live in. All right. So let's get into the nitty gritties here. Uh, the, the law. Uh, we're we're going to cover as much of, of the different layers and shades of gray here uh, that I can, because unfortunately it is kind of complicated. It's it's not really black and white. Um, and there, there's a lot of um, different uh, ways of looking at this. So it's appropriate to start with the basics of, you know, wh why are we talking about this in the first place? Um, Schedule one. This is this is the highest form of um, criminality among substances in our in our country, and similar to the international laws as well. Um, yeah, it, it's considered to to be high uh, potential for abuse and addiction, and you know harm in general. But then, kind of the 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 weird part of Schedule one is that it's deemed to not have any um, medical value. In other words. Uh, not, not only can you not use these substances, but doctors can't either, uh, and, and scientists can't even do it unless they have special permissions. So um, we'll talk about that in a second, uh, but for now, just understand that Schedule 1 does include basically every single psychedelic out there. Um, it really makes you wonder, you know, why that is. But um, yeah, yeah, it's, it's a pretty complete list. Uh, like I said, though, uh, it's not quite black and white, so we'll explain that more later. But um, yeah, yeah, this this sucks. Uh, Schedule one, in my opinion, should be abolished. Uh, it, it, its entire creation, when you look in the history of of how it got made, uh, it was just another you know corrupt uh, group of politicians that they were creating laws to um, subjugate and oppress specific groups of people that were inconvenient to their political power. <laughs> So this little cartoon, I think, nicely illustrates how absurd this Schedule One classification really is, and and ultimately how unscientific it is as well. Because let's say you're a, a researcher and you want to research a substance, but it happens to be on Schedule One, and so you know you go to your you know your your science uh, institutions um, that provide the funding to to do the research, and and um, well they're not big fans of it uh, because. Uh, it doesn't have any accepted medical use. And so um, there's not a lot of reason to research something like that. Um, so you ask why? Well, well, because it's a Schedule One substance, of course, right? It's been, it's been defined that way. And well, then you go to the DEA, Drug Enforcement Administration, and ask them, well, okay, why is this substance on Schedule One? And they say, oh, well, because it has no accepted medical use. Um, so what is the point then of having a classification that you've already determined something that you haven't even looked into yet? Uh, it, it's it's ultimate catch-22. It's, it's almost as though they designed it so that you wouldn't be able to change the classification. Uh, wink, wink, you know. Um, but uh, fortunately, this is changing uh, very, actually, rapidly. So, which is in the last five, ten years, we, we've 
we've gone from looking at uh, psychedelics in particular as just you know a worthless schedule one substances to now there being obvious applications um, but even more silly is the fact that uh, prior to 1970 when the schedule one uh, classification was was created um, there was actually a ton of research with psychedelics. Uh, it, it, it made headlines. It was huge. Uh, it, I mean, it, it swept the, the research community across the world, uh, you know, incredibly fast. Um, unfortunately, everybody got their hands on it, including the Timothy Learys and the, the, the people who were just, you know, throwing LSD at anyone who, who wanted it and, or worse, um, things got bad. And, and I think, um, you know, government was going to act on it inevitably. Unfortunately, what they came up with was awful, but, um, yeah, yeah, this, it's a, it's a weird situation we're in. Okay, so then what is legal? Well, there's actually quite a lot, and this list is definitely going to be changing uh, as the years go on here. Uh, to start, ketamine, uh, not always considered a, a classical psychedelic, but definitely has a lot of similarities uh, and is, is, is clinically used in a similar way too. Ketamine is Schedule Three, meaning that it, it, was, it always had medical value. It's, in fact, a very common and extremely useful substance, um, just not used in the way that they're using it nowadays at the ketamine clinics. Um, uh, it's, a, it's a different dosage level. Um, ketamine in the much higher doses is an anesthetic, uh, and a pretty effective one, too. Um, but otherwise, yeah, the way they're doing it now, uh, you can kind of get a, a pretty trippy experience. Um, it's, it is pretty intense depending on the dose, but um, it's different. Yeah, not, not quite the same kind of serotonergic action uh, that your classic tryptamines have. Uh, cannabis, while also not always really considered a psychedelic, has some similarities. Um, and they're also doing, yeah, cannabis assisted, uh, therapies. Um, the Colorado has got a lot of this California. Um, they're doing pretty similar stuff that you could do with a psychedelic, but obviously cannabis has, um, more flexibility nowadays in certain places in terms of, of, uh, access and legality. Uh, ayahuasca, I mean, all these, all these, uh, uh plant medicines, these traditional, um, entheogens, mushrooms, um, uh, uh, iboga, um, they are just part of the culture in all of South America and, and, and other places. Um, it's, it never was illegal. I mean, making it illegal in, in some of those places, it would, it would be, I mean, there would be war. <laughs> it, I mean, it, it's basically, you know, if, if, um, the Native Americans, uh, now were, were, were fighting for their freedom to use peyote and, uh, unfortunately, they are. Yeah, America has not been kind. Um, that was, well, a side note here, um, peyote was, was heavily criminalized and um, very, very likely because the, the U.S. government knew how detrimental it would be to the, the culture. But anyway, uh, MDMA, um, <laughs> also not a classical psychedelic, but it does a lot of similar stuff and uh, especially clinically used in similar ways and has similar effects. Um, this is on the fast track list of the FDA. Um, it's, it's imminent approval as a legal medicine and, and will probably be the first uh, true uh, Schedule One substance to be removed from the Schedule One list, which will be um, pretty, pretty big. But when you look at what it took to get to that point, also pretty sad. Uh, again, Schedule One is absurd. It's an abomination. Uh, the, the lengths that Rick Doblin and uh, others had to go through to get it to this point of near approval, uh, it should, it should never have had to be that way. So yeah, but there are some, uh, perfectly legal ways to, to experience, uh, oh, uh, Amsterdam, uh, the Netherlands, you know, a lot of mushrooms, psilocybin's like pretty legal there. Um, so, so, you know, if you can travel, you can experience psychedelics in a hundred percent legal setting. All right, plants, uh, nature. There, there are still a few that are free, uh, fortunately. Um, unfor unfortunately, the Controlled Substances Act uh, that created the Schedule One list uh, um, took away some of those those freedoms uh, of ours. And 
Um, it sucks, and we'll talk about which ones are on that list in the next slide. But there are still some uh, psychedelic plants and, and fungi out there that are untouched and, and are 100% legal to own, buy, and sell. Um, Amanita muscaria, uh, the classic toadstool mushroom, the one that they make all the memes about. Um, yeah, it's actually psychedelic. Uh, you, you can consume it and have a pretty intense experience. Um, there's, there's some traditional use. Um, and, and I, I suspect that over time this will, will, you know, gain some popularity. And surprisingly it hasn't already given its, its legality, but, um, there's something there for sure. Uh, the cacti, San Pedro, Peruvian torch. These are mescaline containing cacti similar to peyote. And uh, yeah, you can you can probably find these in a lot of cacti stores, and um, they're they're quite quite common looking. I mean, you you maybe even seen one and didn't even know it. Um, but yeah, as soon as you take a bite out of one of these, you've committed a crime, unfortunately. And um, again, just speaks to how absurd these laws are. Uh, Chacruna, Jerema, Acacia, these are DMT containing plants. And this is a long list. There are so many of these that uh, even if you tried to criminalize it, it would be insane. Uh, the DMT is everywhere. It, it's, you know, and, and probably in amounts that are, are too hard to measure to the extent that it could, it could actually be everywhere uh, in, in some form or another. And um, making it potentially the most like uh, prevalent psychedelic on the planet, which is fascinating. Um, so yeah, yeah, the, these uh, you can buy and sell these. Uh, it's just as soon as you extract them or attempt to consume them. Um, yeah, it's uh, unfortunately crosses the line. Uh, Salvia divinorum, a beautiful psychedelic, uh, not your typical one, but yeah, as of as of now, still federally unscheduled. It is technically legal on a federal level, although there are a number of states that had an emergency scheduling. Uh, I remember when this happened. I was a teenager, and um, yeah, we had our fun with it, <laughs> but ooh, it's intense for sure. So um, yeah, yeah, this uh, it depends on where you are. Although given its lack of federal uh, um, controlling, it's pretty available online. So there are a few plants, unfortunately, that are heavily controlled. Uh, cannabis is the big one. Uh, really quite a testament to how far a government is willing to go to um, oppress certain groups of people, uh, certain lifestyles, and uh, in, in, uh, certain races in particular. Uh, and that is the story behind this. Cannabis kind of was the first uh, substance to go. Uh, that's, that's really what ultimately led to the 1970 Controlled Substances Act. And um, yeah, it's uh, it's insane to what extent that the, this plant uh, has been criminalized. But fortunately, that's changing. So depending on where you are, um, the state laws may um, give you some freedoms. But yeah, technically, this is still federally illegal, 100%. And, um, it, it, and people obviously tried to change this, but uh, it's incredibly difficult. Uh, psilocybin mushrooms as well, uh, despite these just literally being mushrooms, uh, being in possession of these is, is a, a crime. Uh, same with the peyote cacti. This one's especially a sad story. Um, you know, again, the last slide we talked about the San Pedro and uh, Peruvian torch contain mescaline, but are not controlled. So why peyote? Well, yeah, peyote has got a deep tradition uh, with the Native Americans. And if uh, you want to hurt a group of people without um, directly hurting them, you take their medicines. Uh, so, yeah, that one's it's on the list, unfortunately. Uh, opium poppy is another example of that. Uh, you know, cultural significance there is tradition there, too. The plant itself, uh, yeah, illegal. Okay, so when we get down to the chemical level, you know, these are extracted or synthesized substances. Um, basically, yeah, any this this is where it's especially illegal. Um, uh, we're looking at anything that can be in a pill or powder or tab, uh, LSD, DMT, MDMA, psilocybin, THC, mescaline, ibogaine, you know, the whole list there. Um, but also analogs of them, 
the analogs are a little harder to control, um, but uh, we'll talk about that in a second. Um, but yeah, yeah, uh, pretty hard line here. The gray areas, though, are um, they're significant. Um, you, you know, it's 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 difficult. This the idea of of controlling substances as a whole, considering how many different substances are out there and how many ways you can make a substance and how some of those substances are literally in our bodies and growing in our backyard. Um, naturally, there's going to be some gray areas. So. Um, So first of all, the legality when involving plants is, is particularly flexible, um, partly due to the traditions around them. Uh, it's much harder to isolate uh, the specific compounds that are, are you know, deemed to be dangerous and have no medical value uh, when it's a part of a whole plant. So uh, ayahuasca, San Pedro, you know, peyote, um, mushroom, the toad, bufo toad, um, these are attached to some, some ancient lineages, uh, some uh, religious traditions, and we'll talk about this more later, but our country does have some pretty decent religious freedom protections. Um, and there, there is a way to ex practice these substances that our country deems to be okay. Uh, so, yeah, we'll get into that in a bit, but uh, the main points here are once once you cross the line into trafficking substances, buying and selling the substances themselves, particularly outside of the realm of um, the religious practice, yeah, that's that changes the game. That's when it becomes uh, criminal. Um, so yeah, we'll we'll we'll, get, we'll come back to this in a second. All right, research chemicals. So th this is referring to those analogs, the, 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 the compounds that are similar to your LSDs and DMTs and psilocybins, but slightly different. Um, technically, they are federally scheduled to be included on the Schedule One list, but um, more commonly, they exist for quote unquote research purposes only and not for human consumption. Um, again, it's extremely difficult to control substances as a whole because there's so many ways to make them and you can almost accidentally, you know, just have it. And, and so, uh, the, there's a lot of kind of lines you can draw around it, some boundaries to where, uh, you know, as long as you're not using it in the way that the government doesn't want you to, then it's okay. Uh, and this makes them more readily available. Uh, you can purchase research chemicals on the internet, um, you know, not necessarily through the dark web. So um, there's a lot you can read about it too. Some of these are actually fairly well known. Um, a couple books to pick up, uh, T-Call and P-Call, uh, the Shulgans did an incredible amount of research on, on a huge range of, of, of these exact uh, substances. and. Um, you can see a lot of information about it there, but uh, also kind of on this list are, are fungi spores. Um, the psilocybes and copalandias, they, they are, uh, the spores themselves do not have psilocybin in them. It's the psilocybin is grown within the, the fruiting bodies of the fungi. So the spores, you just can't control them. You'd have to make spores illegal. And, and so since um, they're not trying to do that, um, again, spores, you can buy them on the internet. They're, they're, they're just, they're part of nature, frankly, but also usually for research purposes only is kind of what you'll see there. Um, but the thing to just watch out for and be aware of is with, uh, this stuff, there's not as much known about them. And you could also be dealing with more of the kind of impurities and kind of manufacturing issues. Uh, but also you just don't know as much about how it's going to affect you. You know, even just one slight alteration to a molecule can change things pretty dramatically. Uh, so do your research. Some of these uh, though are pretty well understood. Um, you know, a lot of these, they, they, they break up into metabolites that are the same as, um, your classical psychedelic compounds. So it may not matter a whole lot, but, um, again, uh, you're the guinea pig here. So, um, yeah, just, just be extra careful with this. So uh, as far as um, where and when and how uh, the illegal psychedelics are, are being taken, um, 
this is most of what's happening. Uh, this is this is this is how uh, the culture has had to uh, re to exp to work with psychedelics uh, ever since prohibition. So um, it's kind of weird that way. Um, but just some things to understand here that this is serious. Uh, you know, this potential to lead to arrest can come along with some pretty heavy consequences. Uh, the legal fees, jail and prison and, you know, disrupting your job, your relationships, you know, your life. That's kind of the point, though, right, um, to, to treat criminals badly. Um, but, man, these laws. Um, unwritten rules and nuances are, are high risk in the underground. Uh, that's, you know, speaking more to people who have more or less lived outside the, you know, the black market, the underground world, uh, and are thinking of getting into it <laughs> for, for some reason. Um, yeah, it's, it's, uh, it's a different world. They, they run on a different system there. So if you're not familiar with it, you get burned pretty bad. So on top of the, um, the threat of, of, uh, arrest and imprisonment, um, yeah, just the, the rules of the game down there are, are very different. Uh, criminal elements are, it's a, it's a different kind of um, way of thinking. But decriminalization is coming and it's happened in a lot of places already. So what decriminalization means is the process of uh, prosecuting and arresting people uh, that are committing crimes is disrupted. Uh, usually through the defunding or the, the kind of policy changing at the city or state level uh, can lead to a situation where it's still illegal to consume a substance, but the possibility of there being action taken is lowered to such a state where, um, it, yeah, people are, are kind of more free, at least uh, the, the idea of it. Um, a lot of what you'll see, especially in the decriminalized nature group, which is which has taken a big chunk of uh, the decrim work here recently, is this gift, gather, grow concept. And, and that's basically the idea that people want the freedom to uh, not necessarily engage in commercial enterprises with substances, uh, but just to to have the freedom to to consume and grow and, and use the substances. Um, and that's usually an argument that's easier to make in court. It's usually an argument that's easier to make for decriminalization since uh, a lot of the reasons why um, people argue for these substances to be criminalized uh, is, is because of the, the criminal uh, element, uh, the, um, the underground threat, uh, the, 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 the violence, um, gangs and, and whatnot. So um, if, if, that, if that's not part of what people are doing with these substances, then it's it's uh, considered to be safer and more accepted. Um, there's some other groups though that are are really into this process right now. It's it's really really blown up in the last few years. It's, there's actually some funding uh, being pumped into it, particularly from Dr. Bronner, um, David Bronner. He's done quite a bit uh, to help out this effort. Uh, SSDP Drug Policy Alliance. Uh, you'll see those folks a lot. Um, they have a heavier emphasis on equity uh, and reparations. Um, decriminalized nature really fights for the religious and spiritual protections as well as ICERs. And um, so, yeah, this, this you can see having an effect in certain places. Uh, Colorado's uh, recently the first state to, to fully decriminalize. Uh, Oregon as well. So a um, lot, lot of things happening and, and coming in, in the near future. So now we'll get into depth of this realm of religious freedom exemptions, uh, the, the churches, right? There's a lot of ayahuasca churches out there, there's some mushroom churches, bufo churches. And uh, these folks are, are operating with, I mean, the, the risk of, of criminal action here is almost non-existent. Uh, and, and so we'll explain why that is, how they accomplish that um, and, and the implications there. So I'm drawing from a couple documents here that I highly recommend if you're interested in learning about this. Uh, Chakruna and George Lake uh, have done a lot of work to, to help um, this movement of practicing with plant medicines uh, under the religious freedom protections. 
Um, there's a lot here. Uh, I'm just going to cover a few of the main points uh, to just give you the the general idea. But um, this this is uh, this is this is a big deal. It, it has a lot of implications in terms of our freedom to to use these substances. So in general, it's important to understand that uh, the law is not trying to say what your religious beliefs are or whether or not they're, they're real. Um, and that's kind of the core tenet behind religious freedom in our country is, yeah, the freedom to practice religion. And um, the implications in the realm of plant medicines uh, is significant because then if the medicines are included in your religion, your freedom to use them is protected. So the courts, uh, they're not so worried about what your beliefs are. Um, they're just concerned whether or not you're sincere about it. Honest conviction. And so that's the key thing to all of this is, do you mean it? Is your religion legit or is it an excuse to just use controlled substances? And the specific law that uh, gives us this freedom, um, this is actually the amendment to the original law, but this is the thing that you'll see referenced anytime we talk about this, the RFRA, the Religious Freedom and Restoration Act of 1993. So um, very clearly this states that uh, something like a church, uh, anywhere where you're practicing religion, you are exempt from normal laws as long as they're not negatively impacting the health and safety of those involved. And there's, there's nothing uh, leaking out of the religious practice. So in this case, we're talking about plant medicines. Um, the, 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 the controlled substances need to stay in the church, so to speak. Um, and so they're looking for, is this affecting the illicit market? You know, are you, you know, selling uh, substances outside the church? Um, you know, is, is there um, the, the marketing of the substances themselves? You know, you're promoting it um, in a way that you want to sell it. Um, you know, the form of substance can, can affect this. You know, synthetics are a bit uh, uh, harder to deal with. Um, but yeah, and in general, the possibility of, of this creating like um, a trend or, or higher instances of use outside the church. So I'm not, I'm not going to read this whole thing. Uh, this is more just to show uh, a nice list of, of what it kind of takes to be viewed as a legit religion. Uh, and again, your beliefs are not the concern here. You can believe whatever the heck you want to. It's, it's more so how do you demonstrate that you mean it, that there's something meaningful in what you believe, uh, particularly in the realm of the thing that might otherwise be um, illegal. So um, you'll, you'll, as you read through this list, you'll, you'll recognize, you know, when you think about something like Christianity or something like that, um, it's easy to, to see that element exists. And um, it just goes to show that a religion is more than just, you know, having a belief system. There, there's, there's an act, there's, there's a structure around it. There's um, activity, there's, there's a ritual, um, uh, there's even bureaucracy. So the more you can have of this, the more likely you're to be viewed and, and the reason this is uh, coming from the IRS is, is they actually play a big role in um, the process of legitimizing a church, um, partially because you have to become a nonprofit organization to, to get that tax exempt status. And um, it's kind of the system's way of, of uh, checking in on you, you know, you know seeing if uh, your, your books are legit and if it uh, is in line with what your belief system is. So the text that I referenced earlier uh, does a nice job of simplifying this down into um, some parameters that you, you want to make sure you're hitting in terms of your, your belief system. 
um, you'll see that it really gets at the, the big questions. Uh, and, and that's just kind of what spirituality and religion are, are getting at anyway. So if it is legit, then you'll have ideas. You'll, you'll, you'll have to explain yourself. So again, you can kind of imagine a, a religion that maybe you're familiar with and, and you can see that it, it, religion is really a, a lot of little things together that uh, create a certain experience, a lifestyle, a way of doing things that um, that's that's what makes it real for people, right? It's, it's, it's not just saying you're a certain religion, it's, it's a doing. Uh, it's a being, and um, so you can kind of translate this into, you know, what would that look like if um, your belief systems had uh, these, these psychedelic medicines involved with them? So if you've checked out some of my previous classes, uh, we covered the psychological perspective, the spiritual perspective, the neurobiology perspective, all different ways of explaining, you know, what's happening with these psychedelics. Uh, you know, what can we do with them? Um, how are they beneficial? How are they risky? Well, uh, the recreational perspective, I think, is also a valid one, and I, I think there's some core tenets behind it that are distinct from these other perspectives, uh, making it really an important part of understanding, you know, what's possible here. Uh, you know, what what are the potential benefits uh, with these practices. But before we get into that, I want to just give a place for the many layers perspective, reminding us that within any one of these perspectives, it's, it's just one slice of a bigger pie, right? Um, they all together create a, a greater uh, perspective of everything. Um, and we're really just looking at the same thing from different angles. So, So it's safe to say that psychedelics and the party scene have a, a relationship. You know, the, the, the amazing uh, sensory augmentations and alterations that psychedelics cause, uh, it makes for an incredibly interesting time. And, and everything you, you see and hear and touch and smell is in, in you know, the, the depth of it is, is changed uh, in amazing ways. So... Um, you know, this is, this is a big deal. Uh, it's, it's no wonder that we keep flocking to these kinds of experiences in the setting of um, parties, uh, <laughs> the ultimate recreation, right? And uh, there's value here. I, I think it's more than just um, indulgence. Uh, I, I think it's, it's a big part of who we are as human beings. Um, you know, the value of cel celebration, it's an extremely cultural, culturally poignant uh, moment that you know we need that kind of meaning in in our lives uh, to 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 build a connection to you know what we have, what we, what we appreciate, and um, the changes, the ebbs and flows of 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 our lives and our communities. And community too really is at the core of this, right? Um, you know the the party. Uh, sure, I mean, you could have a party of one, you know, in your bedroom if you wanted to, especially if you have some psychedelics. Um, it's still a party, but, uh, you know, partying brings people together, though, too. You know, there's something about um, that sense of connection and the fact that psychedelics, you know, very much lend to a greater connection. Um, it makes sense, you know, it just makes sense that they're, they're part of these experiences, these, these celebrations. Um, 
and you see these in many different forms too. It's it's not just you know um, EDM and lasers and fog machines. It's um, every culture, um, you know, especially when you look at the cultures with entheogenic medicines, uh, the ayahuasca traditions. What are they doing? They're singing and dancing and <laughs> having a good time, connecting uh, in in community and um, and yeah, the psychedelics are part of that. So. Uh, brings people together, uh, and 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 the creative ex expression. Yeah, I mean music, right? Uh, the the arts. Um, it's. I mean, if you haven't made art or sang or listened to music on psychedelics, and you haven't lived, man. <laughs> it's. Uh, it's. Yeah, it just it's just natural, right? You, you just you you experience more with it. So, um, I I think it's important. We, the party is is it's part of our lives. So. Um, you know, this is, this is a big reason why folks are, uh, kind of DIY in the psychedelics. So yeah, be safe with it and, and, um, uh, don't overindulge. So another common scene where you'll find, uh, psychedelic journeyers, um, is, uh, outside, right? Out in the woods, uh, just one with nature. And, uh, it makes a lot of sense. Again, um, nature is just infinite intelligence the the you know you take a look at any like little square inch of 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 what you're um surrounded by outside and there's infinite detail the 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 complexity of nature goes on and on it's just a matter of how how deeply can you perceive it and psychedelics just make that depth go all the way and the appreciation uh, is infinite you, you can just see so many layers beyond what your normal senses are picking up uh, on top of that though nature is free and nature uh, is entirely non-judgmental there's there's no uh, egoic pressures in nature it allows us to get back to our primal selves that uh, you know the, the the part of our brains that is generating the raw data and is normally getting filtered out by uh, all of the um, egoic structures and and hub networks and um, you know ways of, of being that we impose upon ourselves but the combination of nature and being on psychedelics wow you can really uh, uh, open that can up all the way, which is which is really really healing. Uh, so so nature important. Um, uh, so so much to appreciate, and and um, being on psychedelics in nature, the appreciation is all that much greater. So if you haven't seen this, um, what would a psychedelic harm reduction class be without uh, some trippy visuals? Well. Um, it's 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 real, uh, in in and really these uh, artistic depictions are just a, but a snapshot, you know, a a, a very poor uh, facsimile of the real thing, uh, especially DMT, the the types of stuff you can see, uh, it, the 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 just incredibly geometric, kaleidoscopic, phantasmagoric. Uh, portals of, of um, entities and beings and the machine scapes uh, it's it's crazy you know it, it's hard to explain it away truly it, it's part of the experience I mean it's it creates the realms that you go into and you you can journey through so I think not touching on this would would be doing a disservice to the understanding of psychedelics um, you can even see in uh, indigenous artwork, uh, you know, ayahuasca traditions, especially, um, it's these this these designs are embedded into their culture. It's part of who they are. They wear it on their clothes. They put it on their skin. Um, they they design their their environment around it. Uh, it's incredibly meaningful. So uh, I put it in this class because. It's often just kind of thrown away as just a you know a reason to to just get high and and have a good time, but um, I do think that there's something more to it, uh, and and even if it is just fun to look at, um, you know what's wrong with that? <laughs> Again, if you haven't actually seen this, uh, trust me, it it's it's crazier than you can possibly imagine. 
So there's truly no separating the aesthetic from the experience and, and the reality, truly. Uh, I mean, one of the fascinating things that came out of uh, the modern DMT research was the very common report that the what they saw, where they went, the, th the things they experienced seemed more real than what they previously thought of as real. You know, it's like, what does that mean? Okay, <laughs> if, if what we normally think of as real is not as real as it could be, then what are we really seeing here in these, these kaleidoscopic patterns, these um, geometric portals uh, and of, of color and, and design? Well, maybe it is real. Maybe that is what's kind of behind the curtain. Um, Again, you, you have to see it to really believe it, but um, you, you just listen to you know the many many people that can attest to this, and and also just the the ancient ancient wisdom of the cultures that have embraced this that you know they never went as far as uh, criminalizing it. Um, just look at how significant it is to them. So this recreational perspective, I, I, I think. It, it creates a, another way for us to appreciate what more is there in life. You know, there's there's the, the freedom of um, experiencing these expanded states of consciousness without boundaries. Inevitably, that's that's how you're going to see what's on the other side of the rainbow. You know, what's beyond the horizon. So, um, yeah, there's value here. I think it would also be a disservice, though, to ignore that there is a potential for risk here. You know, anytime we're going into the world of psychedelics without, you know, boundaries and without uh, restraint, yeah, we're rolling the dice. The, these are infinitely vast and complex realms. Consciousness is the ultimate frontier. Uh, there is so much we don't understand from a kind of modern cultural or scientific perspective especially uh, there's no way you can measure this stuff it's there's so much there um, so it is it is diving into the unknown and um, uh, and I think we're going to see as the psychedelic revolution unfolds the what really the true power and darkness of psychedelics uh, some of the ones to keep an eye out for, uh, especially if you're getting involved with, um, uh, you know, having an having an experience or like a guided journey or a ceremony, is um, one of them. Ego hyperinflation. I talk about this a lot more in my other classes, but um, it may seem ironic that you know we think of psychedelics as breaking down the ego, but the thing is, the ego comes back. And sometimes it comes back with a vengeance. And in fact, I do believe that psychedelics are a tool of not just breaking down the ego, but of building it back up. Um, people that use a lot of psychedelics, you'll see they, they can move through a lot of their personality structure in, in shorter periods of time. And that can go both directions. You know, you could build yourself into a person that has a lot of integrity and is integrated well into the community, or you could turn into a monster, you know, and, and I think history has shown that that's already happened uh, and it can do incredible damage to uh, selective integration. Uh, I would say that's just kind of a more general kind of tame way to explain potential for ego, ego hyperinflation. Um, more specifically, the act of integrating but only integrating the things that you want to integrate um, and this can happen when we're not integrating into community when you know we're, we're doing this more on our own uh, you know DIY you know has has its its risks so um, check out my other classes uh, particularly rhythms of integration to learn more about um, what what I see as a healthy way to integrate and to avoid selective integration uh, spiritual vulnerability, that's a big one. Uh, the, these are spirit realms that we're opening up inside of us. Um, we, as a culture, modern culture, we, we do not have a good understanding of how to protect ourselves in those realms uh, or that they even exist and that they're, they're real. 
But uh, yeah, you take enough psychedelics, it will get real, real fast. <laughs> so um, this is big, you know, the whole guru complex, uh, uh, psychedelic messiahs, um, cults. <laughs> um, yeah, it, it, the spiritual vulnerability is 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 legit here. You could you could you could do things to yourself that you you're not even aware of because uh, you you just you know haven't experienced things on that level before. So um, just be careful where you're doing it, who you're doing it with. Uh, take the time to to get to know this stuff. It's it's definitely worth it. So good work as always. This is the end of the DIY harm reduction class. Uh, I hope now you feel more confident in um, exercising your right to cognitive liberty and to explore your consciousness. Uh, it's unfortunately, you know, not an easy process always, but um, when you understand the reality of, you know, the society we live in, the, the set of laws that we uh, have and the stigmas out there, um, there is a way to do this. You know, the, this, this doesn't have to be uh, the, the underground dirty thing that, uh, our society has made it out to be, um, things can change the, it's, it's all, it's all up here. It's your, your beliefs. So you change that and then you can change everything else. And there's a ton more awesome content in the psychedelic harm reduction course, 12 classes all together, each one designed to offer some really in-depth practical education on how to reduce your risks, maximize your benefits. And you can view all the slides for every class for free at openmindintegration.com. And there's a bunch of other educational content up there as well. And my personal services, of course, for people going through preparation and integration processes here to help here to help folks go a little deeper, uh, be a little safer about it. So um, please let me know. Thank you.